My name is Lisa Polito. I'm 47 years old. Today is April 24th, 2013. We're in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I am here with Steve Rossi of the famous comedy, comedy team, team, Alan and Rossi. Alan and Rossi, And I correct. just met Steve. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, my name is Steve Rossi, and uh, I just want you people who might have forgotten that I look a lot better when, when I was alive. Anyhow, I am uh, 80 years old. I'll be 81 May 25th, uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here on uh, radio with Lisa and Anna. And today's date is April 24th, 2013, Las Vegas, Nevada, the city of everything. The city of everything. So, Steve, I understand that you have lived in Las Vegas for most of your life. Most of my life, yes. Where did you live before um, Las Vegas? Just so I lived in, uh, well, I was born in New York, moved to Hollywood, California when I was uh, seven, seven years old, seven and a half. And my dad, uh, Santi, my real name is Taffarella. My dad, Santi Taffarella, was the world's greatest trumpet player at that time in music's who's who. And that was in 1929, and of course, ever since. And he was also the... Uh, musical arranger for Axel Stordahl, who had the orchestra at that time for Frank Sinatra. And, and was that the move to California? To uh, that was the move, yes. When He, he moved to uh, California about 1936. And then uh, when, in, when I was seven, he had me audition for the Mitchell Boy Choir, which was the first professional boy choir in America. And I was the soprano soloist, and then we did a series of movies, including Going My Way, The Bells of St. Mary's, uh, movies with Loretta Young and with Cary Grant, et cetera, et cetera, The Bishop's Wife, movies with uh, Roy Rogers and Gene Autry, et cetera. And we were the choir that you always saw in those old movies. And so that was all when you were in California? When I was in California, yeah. At the age of, uh, starting at the age of seven till I was about 13. And... Uh, my dad was writing uh, musical arrangements not only for Sinatra at that point, but for um, Perry Como before he became famous, and also for Tony Martin, who was a big singing star in those, that era, and uh, quite a few uh, people from that era. And uh, so we went to see Tony Martin one time. We drove from Los Angeles to Las Vegas on the old road, the old dirt road, and we went to the El Rancho Vegas when I was seven, so that was 1939. And there was no strip. It was just a dirt road there as well. And uh, there was a, a bingo club across the street from the El Rancho, and it was just a one-level building, and you could just barely see it at night because there was just a little light on it, on the, on the sign. And the El Rancho had a showroom that seated 300 people, and... Uh, we went to see Tony Martin and Sophie Tucker, who was a big star as well in the, those years. After the second show, because we didn't get there till late, and from that point on, through the history of Las Vegas for many, many years, uh, up until the, the late 70s, there was always two shows a night, 8 o'clock and 12 o'clock. Of course, that has since changed. And uh, so we went to the late show, and when the show was over, we went outside to go to walk to our rooms. At, at that time, it was basically a glorified bungalow with, um, with little rooms, s bungalows. It was a bungalow, actually, with a motel-type bungalow. And they had 24 bungalows. And as we were walking toward the room, I looked across the street, and I saw the bingo club. And, and I realized there was nothing else on the strip at that point. And then I looked to my right, and there was a big crowd of people on just on the dirt side, you know, like a sidewalk, but it was in dirt as well. And there were about, I, I'd say about two or 300 people. I'm saying, where the hell are they all coming from? And they were going into the last frontier, which was right next door, and which was built after the El Rancho. The El Rancho was built, I believe, uh, in the uh, 39, 1939, and then last frontier, I think, about 40, 41. So long before the Flamingo, which was considered a hotel, only because it had two levels, 
And I went to the opening there in 1946 with my dad. And they only stayed open about a week. And they had Jimmy Durante as the star. And then they had to close the hotel because it wasn't completed to code. And they didn't have the pool in yet. And it was only shortly afterward that Bugsy Siegel, who built it, was uh, killed in, uh, in Hollywood for not coming in on schedule. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, so I got on that line. And it was to see the first lounge act in the history of Las Vegas called the Mary Kay Trio. And so I was only seven, uh, about seven and a half, eight years old. And after the show, we went up to get an autograph because they were kind enough to give autographs to the audience. And that was at 2 o'clock in the morning. And they did shows at 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 6 in the morning. In the 30s, 1939, today you can't see anything after like 1 o'clock. Everything's closed except the disc jockeys, you know, DJs. <laughs> So that was the beginning of my uh, knowledge about Las Vegas. And then I came back when I was 20 years old, and I was the singing star with Mae West, who was a big movie star at that point. And she had a bus bunch of muscle men, Mr. America, Mr. World, Mr. Universe. Now, I played her straight man, and I was her uh, singer in the show. And how old were you then? I was 20. Okay. I was going to Loyola University in Los Angeles at the time. Now, I wasn't living here at that point, but I did come here shortly after, in about 1956. So I've been here over 50 years. But I'm one of the few people alive that remembers mm -hmm. the old Las Vegas Strip before it became the Strip. So what was that like, performing with Mae West it was here in Las Vegas? It was fantastic. And it, in fact, to this day, there's never been a more exciting opening number than she did. She had eight muscle men. And they were just wearing glorified G-strings, you know, or bikini bottoms, and they were gold lame. And when she came out, she just walked down some steps, and this pin spot hit her. And and he, we saw this little dim lights over the a scrim. There was a scrim, and behind the scrim were these seven muscle men. They were all greased up, and they were on small pedestals that had to be activated by turning them on you know, activating so that they could just step on a pedal and then they would turn around. So their backs are to the audience, but the uh, women in the audience could literally see the outline of these, you know, magnificent guys. And they were screaming like you couldn't believe it because they wanted to see them without the scrim and they wanted to see them in the front. So Mae West came to the, the staircase and as soon as they, she did, they had a pin spot on her face and I wrote the opening song with her. And it was called Everyone Knows It's a Man's World. So, so she came out and she started saying, Everyone knows it's a man's world. That's how the world was designed, to show off the female anatomy, which appeals to the masculine mind. Da, 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 da. Why should this sort of pleasure be exclusively meant for the men? I'm sure you girls would like a little display of the opposite sex now and then. The scrim opens. The overhead lights are now full, on the, and you just the audience is looking at it from the back. You have never seen such pandemonium long before the Chippendales. I'm talking 1953, uh, 1953, and it was pandemonium. There were a lot of security. Luckily, women were jumping on stage trying to just touch them, you know, like they do when they see the Chippendales today. Only that was the original. And then they stepped on the pedal after about five minutes of screaming and hysterically. And the and the husbands were screaming at their wives at the same. What? Well, it's just a man. Yeah. No. No. This is. These are different than men. And so that they step on the pedal, and now the the pedestals revolve, and now you're looking at them head on, and you're looking at Mr. America, Mr. World, Mr. Universe. In fact, a couple of them, Mickey Hargitay, who was Mr. Uh, Universe at the time, and he married Jane Mansfield. You know, and then you had Joe. Jo uh, you had. Uh, Joe Gold, who l ended up opening, op opening up Gold's Gyms. Then you had George Eiferman, who was uh, Mr. World at the time. And he was, uh, he, uh, George Eiferman opened up G George Eiferman Gyms all over the world as well. And his son, who is a dear friend of mine, who is in his late 40s now, I just met him like about a year ago. He's a singer, comedian, comedian rather, 
and he works at Cabo Wago, Cabo Wabo, yeah, Cabo Wabo on the Strip, and on uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and he's hilarious, just ad libbing with the audience. Anyhow, he has pictures of me with his father and Mae West from 1953, about a dozen of them that I had never seen. And um, and then from then on, after the Mae West thing, I went in the Air Force as a as the uh, as a second uh, second lieutenant, and then got out in two years. And in '55, I was a production singer at the Sands Hotel, and uh, for uh, about. Uh, a year and a half, and then I signed a contract with Johnny Mathis's manager, uh, Helen Noga, who's no longer alive, and she got me a contract with Columbia Records, the same label that Johnny is to this day. We're both the same age, Johnny and I. We both I met him in San Francisco when he was uh, 25 years old. When I was in the Air Force, I was doing a local television show. Where actually, it was, uh, it was uh, in about five states called The Don Sherwood Show, on uh, KGO TV in San Francisco. I was the co-host of the show. I was, you know, like Johnny Carson. And but anyhow, uh, that was my beginnings on television. Then in 1958, while I was production singer at the Sands, I became very friendly with Nat King Cole, and he told me about this guy he thought was funny, Marty Allen. And he introduced me to him over the phone and we got together, and he gave us a check for $5,000 to put the act together. And we got it together about eight, nine months later. And then he took us on a world tour with him for two and a half years, including two command performances in England. And then from then on, um, Marty and I started getting on uh, television shows, Perry Como, the old Jackie Gleason variety show out of New York. Uh, he had Sullivan shows. We have the claim to over 41 appearances, including that picture I showed you of us with the Beatles, which is this is the 49th anniversary of that show that we did. And next year I'm going to hopefully be doing the Letterman show because I'm friends, friends with uh, some friend, people from the show, which I think could be a great thing because it's the same theater, the Sullivan Theater. So hopefully that will come through. And it looks like there's an opportunity. And uh, then Marty and I got... Lucky with all the television shows. We did uh, Password, To Tell the Truth, What's My Line, uh, almost every game show you could imagine. We did Donna Shore, we did Perry Como, we did Dean Martin, we did The Rose, we did, we did everything. The Tonight Show is starting with Steve Allen, then with Jack Parr, and then with eventually with uh, uh, Johnny Carson, and then uh, once with uh, Jay Leno. So we, we were on The Tonight Show all four eras of The Tonight Show. And I know you're looking at me, how can he be 80 years old? He looks I so am. young. He <laughs> looks so young. Like, you know. Anyhow, it's, it's just a lot of plastic surgery. But anyhow, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but um, uh, then when Marty and I got hot, you know, we were the next top comedy team after uh, Martin and Lewis. But a lot of people don't realize that we were on television over a thousand times, and Martin and Lewis were only on about 14. So we had tremendous exposure on, on television, probably more than Lucille Ball and Ed Sullivan, people with weekly shows, because we were doing every conceivable type of show, game shows, uh, one, you know, star shows, uh, variety shows, everything you can imagine, plus over 2,000 appearances on, on radio. And then uh, while I was still with Marty, during one of the periods his wife died, and then I was uh, performing alone, including Sullivan and a bunch of the other shows, and Mike Douglas and Merv Griffin, those shows, uh, I became a manager. So I ended up, uh, I mean, for other people, I was managing uh, Alan and Rossi without getting paid as a manager, just to, to book the act you know, through different agents. And then I, t I found a guy in Washington, D.C., uh, who was doing a show, and I really liked him. And he was limited to the kind of dialogue that he could have on radio. And it was Howard Stern. And I managed him after he got fired in Washington, D.C., brought him to New York, and the rest is history. I was, he was with me for six years, became a big star, and uh, which I'm happy for. And uh, amazingly, the Howard Stern that we that we knew 
uh, from radio with the risque things and you know the the insult kind of things that he did because he's a brilliant brilliant uh, communicator. I would call him more than anything. But that was not him. That was just a persona that he created. Now when you see him on America's Got Talent, you're seeing the real Howard Stern, who happens to be a nice guy, who be happens to be lovable and kind and considerate and compassionate and, and funny as can be. And uh, that's the real Howard Stern that you're watching on television today, not the old one. That was just, he was an actor at that point. He was just playing a character. And uh, I'm very happy for his success, and I'm glad he finally came out to, to be the real guy that he is, you know. And then uh, just kept going and uh, managed Trini Lopez, who had many hits when I got him back on uh, Roulette Records, uh, Lemon Tree, Guantanamera, uh, If I Had a Hammer. In fact, he's doing a show with me next week, in, uh, this next weekend. Uh, a charity event you know, in uh, Palm Springs, California, a uh, big ce celebrity golf tournament uh, for Willie Mays, a big charity, the children's charity, Willie Mays Say Hey mm -hmm. Charity. And I host a lot of celebrity golf tournaments and charity events uh, every year, probably 20 or 30 a year. And uh, currently I'm producing and uh, co-directed the... Uh, Jimmy Stewart and Friends at the LVH Hotel used to be the Hilton in the, in the uh, Shimmer Cabaret Theater. And we've been there for eight months. It just held us over another four months. And now we have uh, some major producers looking to bring the show to Broadway, and we're in, in negotiations right now. So, And I co-wrote the show with Rich as well. And I've already invited you and uh, Anna. When you get back, if you're back before uh, July, you can uh, be my guest and see the show. It's Thank a phenomenal one-man show. Rich Little, playing the part of Jimmy Stewart, introduces uh, all of his star friends. Henry Fonda, Johnny Carson, Andy Rooney, who just recently passed away. And it's there's 37 characters, including three presidents. And it's probably the greatest one, not because I'm directing it and produced it, but from for pr true and and wonderful entertainment. Who else could recreate these people right on stage? And each one of them tells a funny story. So you're talking about over 100 laughs in 90 minutes. It's got streaming video to, that, that, that uh, designates all of the places and people that he met through the years when he won his Academy Awards, when he was uh, in the Air Force as a bomber pilot and became a brigadier general. Just a phenomenal show, and you know, I, I'm proud that I'm involved in it even as a producer, director, and co-writer because I'm lucky enough to have have the greatest impressionist of all time, you know, Rich Little, starring in it. And then, uh, you know, we, I I do a lot of charity events mm -hmm. in uh, Las Vegas, and uh, I've been uh, w working on a brand new show. Uh, a burlesque musical comedy called The Friggin' Show, of all things. And it's based on a, a s the son of a guy like a Dr. Phil, who, won who was in vaudeville originally, not Dr. Phil, but someone like him, who be gets his own, his own television show. And the real name of the family was the Frigginson's family. And he had a, such a dislike for his father, the part that I'm going to play, that he took the sun off. He says, I'm going to change the name of my show when I get my show. So it's called The Friggin' Show. It is absolutely hilarious. And uh, the music is incredible. It was written by Heidi Thompson and her husband, uh, Gene Saronin. And I wrote four or five of the songs in the show. But it's absolutely magnificent music. I mean, it sounds like an ego trip when I'm saying it, but... After you're in the business for 50 or 60 years, you sort of know what really works and what doesn't, you know? And uh, and that's why I think the J Rich Little thing is so good is because I know comedy and I know what works with Rich. And people walk out and they just say, this should be on Broadway right now. It is so incredible. And uh, they said, it's, you know, a lot of people say it's the greatest evening they've ever had in the theater. And this is just a small cabaret theater. 
Awesome. So is there anything I can ask you? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, you've talked <coughs> about a lot of the work that you've done, but <coughs> I know oh, excuse me. it sounds like some of that work has been here in Las Vegas and some elsewhere. Most of it has been here. Most of it has been here. Uh, the the uh, five years uh, or more that I was with uh, Howard Stern was in New York when uh, Marty's wife had passed away during that period. And he was in mourning for a long time, and he didn't know if he wanted to get back into the business of comedy, which I can understand it. You know, and we hear about the thin line between tragedy and comedy. Well, unfortunately for for Marty, he had that he was that thin line, and it took him a long time to to be able to get back to doing it, which we did, and then we did it for another fifteen years. We were together off and on about thirty five, forty years. Where is Marty now? Marty's in uh, Las Vegas. He lives about two or three miles from me. And he's just turned 91. And he's healthy and funny and just is amazing, you know. For, you know, And he uh, looks almost as good as I do, which is amazing because he's already 10 you years older. You do look amazing, Steve. Well, I just have to you. say since we'll, there will be a photo we take with the archive yeah. recording. But I would have said you were young, maybe mid 60s that's what i would have guessed that's what a lot of a lot of women take me for mid 60s uh, some take me for 100 but anyhow <laughs> i just <laughs> and i do now work alone as well as a stand up uh, comedian i at my age i thought i'd be a lay down comedian <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know uh, a lot of people you know like i came to las vegas like i said uh, 72 years ago for arthritis and i finally got it so that's why I stayed, so I could keep keep my arthritis going. We don't have a drum set in here. No, no, the drum drum. No, yeah. Drum -dum. So you most of the time your career brought you to, or you were living to in Las, Las Vegas. Yeah, so I've been living in Las Vegas over fifty years, and I have a, a I had a home in uh, California, North Ranch, for several years, and I had a penthouse apartment in New York for about 10 years during the period that I was with uh, Howard Stern. So I've been very fortunate. You know, for years I thought nothing was going to happen. And originally when I started out, I was under contract that uh, when I was at the same time I was working with Mae West, I was under contract at 20th Century Fox f for a year where they taught me how to duel and dance a little bit. And I thought I had a chance at that time uh, to be the lead, you know, in, mu in musicals, which unfortunately for me was the end of the musical, you know, where you had Howard Keel and you had so many wonderful singers and Mario Lanza. And, uh, but I was in that, in that genre, you might say. And I played the lead in a lot of shows for the Civic Light Opera Company in Los Angeles when I was only 17. I was the youngest lead in, in any, in, Vagabond King, New Moon, Student Prince, Oklahoma, on and on and on. So I thought I had a real chance because my reviews were so great. You know, the LA Times and the, uh, all of the uh, Hollywood papers and the, you know, the billboard and the variety. So that's how I got my uh, audition to get a contract at 20th Century Fox. And then when I left there I, and got out of the Air Force, I was a production singer at the Sands in 1956 to almost 1958. And then I got with Marty in 1950, late, later, the la later part of 58. And we went with Nat King Cole for three years. And then we became stars on our own. And in 1961, I went back to the Sands as the star of the show with Marty Allen. So it's quite a history. It's quite a history. You talked about being very young and visiting Las Vegas with yeah, your dad I was just when you seven were about and seven. And, yeah. and there was dirt road, no yeah. strip. So through all of those years, 72 years, yeah. what are some of the most memorable changes that you've seen or that stand out to you? Well, uh, you know, in the early years when they first built the uh, Flamingo, which was the beginning of high rises if you want to consider two stories a high rise it was actually the beginning of it then later on <coughs> they went into legitimate high rises like the riviera which is still basically the same building that it was uh, 16 or 20 stories and you had the flamingo which was basically a good portion of the flamingo is still there 
you know, where the casino is on the corner of Flamingo. And, uh, and then when the Tropicana was built and the Sands Hotel, because even though they were high rises and stuff, it was still a, an intimate town where you could walk across the street, say hello to your friends, where you'd hang out at the Sands in the garden room at the Sands, with, and all the stars from the other hotels would come by at two o'clock in the morning and they'd hang out in the lounge and I'd sing in the lounge here when, when I was already starring at the Sands and Nat King, Nat King Cole came in and then we'd go in the lounge when he was there because I usually would come in to see him because I was living in Hollywood at that point. I didn't have, you know, in, in the 50s I wasn't living here yet or even in the early 60s. But then I, you know, bought properties here during, during the years. And uh, so then we, you know, we'd hang out and I'd sing in the lounge and that and I would ad lib and I'd do and start doing impressions. He would do impressions and we just, it was just a fun town because in, in those days, if you were just playing a dollar blackjack, the pit bosses would come up to you and say, uh, here, have a comp breakfast, have a comp lunch, you know, so that the, a person that didn't have money and was just gambling was treated like somebody who did have money. Like today, you know, they only give cops to people who don't need them, people that are rich, instead of people who are, you know, the average person that is maybe playing for $5, you know. They want to give a cop to them for a buffet. But if somebody's gambling, you know, $50,000 a month, they can have anything they want because that same guy who's a multimillionaire could own the hotel if he wanted to. So it's ironic that that happens, you know. And uh, I miss the, the good old days when, when all the stars would congregate in the, in the coffee shop at the Sahara, in the garden room, at, which was the coffee shop at the Sands Hotel, and where we'd tell jokes and we'd hang out in the lounges in the early days, the, you know, the, f the second lounge, not the main lounge, the first lounge was the last frontier with Mary Kay Trio who later on went into the Congo room, at, not the Congo room, but the Sahara uh, lounge here, where uh, I'm trying to remember what they called it in those the early days. But anyhow, it's where uh, Louis Prima and Katie Smith were, where it's where uh, uh, Victor Mom worked there in the early years. People that weren't big enough headliners would work there, like Don Rickles became a headliner from working there in the Sahara, in the lounge here at the Sahara. And uh, it was just an, a different era, and people stayed up late, and people went to late shows. I mean, t you know, today, after 11 o'clock, if you're not a young, uh, you know, young person in your 20s or 30s, you know, you're, you're, you're asleep. And the people that are in their 20s and 30s come in from L.A. or from Phoenix or wherever to go to all the nightclubs now. And they have to pay to get online to pay $20 for a drink or uh, $150 for a bottle of cheap champagne. I mean, it's just, it, it became so commercial that it's no longer fun. You know, it's not even, and you can't identify with it. I mean, I can, even at my age, I can still identify with people in their 20s and 30s because I try to keep my act, you know, contemporary and, and talk about funny things that are happening now, you know, so that they can identify with it as well. You know, like uh, I'll do a line in, in, my, in my routine and I'll say, uh, I say, my wife is a very quiet lady, never makes a sound. Last night I was in bed making passionate love. I said, honey, why are you so quiet? She said, because I'm in the bathroom, you idiot. So I do stuff that young people can laugh at. Unfortunately, you two didn't yet, but you'll get it later on. <laughs> but uh, people that, that are listening, they, they will realize that that's pretty damn funny. And I said, well, you know, I said, stay there. I'm doing better without you. But anyhow, <laughs> these, you know, th I do stuff that will identify with young people. Uh, I don't do old jokes and old corny stuff. You know, I do stuff that's hip and today. And I write it all myself, so it's not like they heard it before. You were talking about um, w that you missed the old days and that how it was like hanging out in the lounge and the coffee shop with other performers well, the, well, and stars and so yeah, when not only not, not only stars but like you mentioned performers yeah. you know when because we were always you know we all remembered when we started out and when right. we struggled you know so, so when do you think 
that started to change, and why do you think it changed? I think it changed when uh, Howard Hughes came into town and he bought the Sands and the Frontier. And so about when Hotel. was that? I would say uh, early, probably the early 70s, you know, maybe mid-70s. And once that's when the town became corporate because a corporation owned most of the hotels, even then. You know, today you have Harris that owns half of the Strip and off the Strip, you know, like with the Rio and other hotels, not to mention hotels around the world. And then you have MGM, Mirage, that owns the other half. So it's all corporate now, you know. And it, you know, unless you know one of the corporate executives, you, you know, you're not going to be treated like you used to be when you were considered a star in, you know, headlining in hotels. Because most of those people that are running those corporations are a lot younger. They're in their 40s or 50s. So you say Steve Rossi or Rich Little or people like that, and they say, well, who are they, you know? Well, we're the ones that helped to build Las Vegas. That's who we are. What kind of uh, the entertainment that are at those at those corporate-owned hotels, wh what do you see different well, about the entertainment uh, that's there Well, that's, now? That, that's, that's a, great qu it's a great question because uh, in the old days... You had mostly stars in the hotels. At the Flamingo, you'd have an Ella Fitzgerald. At the Sands, you'd have a Sammy Davis. At the Desert Inn, you'd have uh, Robert Goulet. At the Frontier, you'd have Wayne Newton. You know, at Caesars, you'd have Alan and Rossi. We worked at the, we headlined at the Caesars, at the Sands, at the Riviera, at the Frontier, at the Desert Inn, and at the Flamingo. So you know, because in those days. Headliners could headline anywhere as long as they did business and they were on television all the time, which we were. But today, most of the shows are Cirque du Soleil. They're all big production uh, shows, basically the same type of show, maybe a di little bit different theme, a fire theme or a water theme like La Rev at the Wynn Hotel, which is it's not a Cirque show, I don't believe. I think it's Steve Wynn brought that in as a separate thing. But it's it's a production show with water, primarily water, and instead of having uh, variety acts, you now have these incredible uh, dancers and, uh, and acrobats instead of, you know, a juggler or th that kind of thing, unless, you know, once in a while you see a juggler in a Cirque du Soleil, but generally it's, it's acrobats and it's incredible production. I mean, there's no taking away the production and everything. But once you've seen one of those shows, you've really seen them all. Unless you just happen to be a junkie and you want to see the next Ka or the next Cirque du Soleil show. The, the only difference uh, maybe that Cirque du Soleil has is uh, Love, you know, the Beatles show, because it's based on the Beatles music. It's not so much of a Cirque show as it is a Beatles show. But when they did an Elvis show at the... Uh, uh, trying to remember which which Mandalay Bay or one of the Luxor, it didn't work because they had a show that was basically a Cirque type show and Elvis, instead of being someone portraying Elvis of which there are so many great people that do, they had a guy on stilts that looked like an Elvis with you know fake sideburns and I mean, to me it was like a the biggest put down of Elvis you could ever imagine. I mean at least have a guy that looks like him and pay the respect to wh whoever he is. But they didn't do that. And that's why the show closed, because it didn't make sense, you know? And uh, so y y you can have a gimmick, but sometimes you go too far with it. And then, the you know, for the longest time, there were magic shows. And now, basically, it's Copperfield, David Copperfield, who is one of the greatest. And, of course, Lance Burton was great. For many years, he was here, and some of the other magicians. But uh, they they finally ran out, and David Copperfield just comes in when he's not on tour, you know. But he works, you know, primarily at the MGM because that he has an exclusive deal with them. So there's a, a whole difference in, in the entertainment, and and then for years you had a you you had nightclubs or you had uh, supper club type settings. And people would eat and, you know, and dine. They'd dine and they'd maybe go and see a show after the show or, you know, after dining or before. 
And now, if from I guess around 11 o'clock on, if you're not crazy enough to want to go to one of those nightclubs where they charge you incredible amounts of money just to get in, to spend a, a, a more incredible amount of money to, to stay there, to try to maybe get a date with a gal or a guy, whatever it is, and you can't even hear each other talk. It's, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. And they're paying 20 bucks for vodka and uh, vodka martini when you could buy it in other places for like 3 or $4. You know? But uh, just, I guess, to say that they were at this club or Hayes or whatever the, the names are, I mean, and the biggest grossing business in Las Vegas are the nightclubs. They outdo the casinos. That's how big they are. So it's different kind of a show business. Do you think that the the performers, the stars of the same caliber from that earlier era, um, who are contemporary popular performers now, singers, singers, dancers? Yeah. Do you think some of their expectation expectations about performing maybe affect whether those kinds of stars? perform here like well i mean the reality is in the old days we used to perform here four weeks at a time i'm talking in the 50s 60s and 70s and up how to many the nights 80s. a week seven nights a week for four weeks yeah 14 performances a week uh four weeks at a time that's 56 shows and marty allen and i performed an average of eight to ten weeks a year in Las Vegas, including four years in a row at Vegas World, which was 50 weeks a year, that was 200 performances there alone, right? And yet when they said the most, the, the stars that were here the most and that on stage starring at various hotels, and they made th named three or four people that never did one-tenth the amount of shows that we did. And we were like listed 38. And I'm saying, how can that be when we performed here over 2,000 times? Even Wayne Newton didn't do that. And he was here for years. You know, uh, I mean, some of the production shows, you know, like, you know, the Lido de Paris outdid us because they were here for 10, 15, 20 years. But in the period of time that we worked here, over 2,000 appearances, I mean, we should be in the top three. And we were like listed 38 because... It, you know, it's some young guy, you know, 25 years old, is is looking at some books and th thinks that he's got the right information, and he doesn't, you know. And whoever that guy or girl is, you know, but should really check the background of uh, Alan and Rossi as, as stars here because it's there. The information is there. So we have just a few minutes left. Yeah. And I'm wondering, since you've seen so much history and you've participated in so much of the entertainment history of Las Vegas, what would you hope for entertainment industry in Las Vegas in the future? Well, what I hope for and what's what's feasible are two different things. I said what you hope yeah, for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it ain't going to happen. You know, uh, what's the superstars, the, the people that used to work in Las Vegas, you know, the great comedians, uh, the great singing stars, the great singing groups, you know, they really have no place to work in Las Vegas on a regular basis. I mean, today, I mean, we used to work four, di four weeks at a time, 56 shows a month. Today, if you get booked twice in a year for one night, you're doing great. You're considered a star. And you go into the Mirage, and you go there for one night, and you do one, one or two shows, and they say, okay, see you next year. Maybe if you do the counts, if you do the business. Of course, with the price of tickets today, even when you're a big star, unless you're a Celine Dion or something like that, it's hard to sustain for more than two or three years, even though you're only doing one night a week, a month, a year rather, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that's going to happen again. And the showrooms are so much bigger than they were in those days. In those days, the Sands was only uh, seated about 520 people. The Riviera originally seated about 800. Now it's up to about 12. But we were filling it up every single show when we started the Riviera for seven years. And that was eight to 10 weeks a year. And we were doing two shows a night. That's 2,400 people a mm -hmm. show times 10, 10 weeks. It's 24,000 people a year, you know, times probably 20 years. I mean, that's a lot of people and a lot of shows. And, uh, you know, 
I'm glad this is being recorded because the archive should have the, the real facts and not just uh, somebody else just saying it, what yeah. they think are the facts. So what I know what they are. What would it take to have that kind of access for performers again? It, it, I don't see it ever going back to that because mm -hmm. the rooms are just getting bigger and bigger. I mean, where Celine Dion is is over 4,000 seats. I mean, even Seinfeld, who's one of the biggest comedy stars ever, can only go there and for one or two nights and, and not even fill it. But at least he can do, you know, three, four, th 3,000 at least, you know. And, you know, Neil Diamond and people that are still pretty big names that have a big fan base can't do it. But... Uh, well, believe it or not, or through. We've run to the end of our I time. I can't imagine. It seems like we've only been here about two hours. <laughs> Steve, I want to thank you so much for coming in and My recording pleasure. your stories. Yeah, and you want to some? I'll sign any releases you want because <laughs> I'd like this story to get out there before uh, it's too late for me to find out about it. You know. Right. Thank you so much. My pleasure.